Good evening, everybody. I'm Jim Ladd. Tonight, for the first time ever on this show, we'll meet two of the five players who make up the relentless metal music of UFO. They are lead vocalist Phil Mogg and bass player Peter Way. And I can promise you an exciting hour ahead, which will include stories about Beatles producer George Martin, the disappearance of former UFO guitarist Michael Shanker, and of course, a lot of brain-melting rock and roll. As we now take you on an interview of UFO. Hi, I'm Pete Way from UFO, bass guitar player. Phenomenal. Occasionally. <laughs> Occasionally. Occasional bass guitar player when I can see it. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Phil Moggs, uh, the singer. I always find it rock and roll, uh, rock music, to be an, it's an escape. It's something to escape to, something that is real comfortable that you can forget all the realities of what's going on around you and just go and enjoy it. When we first came here and we used to put on the telly and we used to get the news continuously on soap operas, we used to go, oh no, it's welcome to misery. And we used to turn it off. And I think that rock's just an, an escape. A lot of it's those kind of um, fantasy, you know? You're imagining that, uh, if you like, listen to Springsteen, Born to Run, you're not in that situation, or you haven't been, but you can imagine that situation. And I can still relate that back to being escapist. Mystery Train. All oh, right. That's an old, old song, and, it, and very, very well done. Who did, who played that acoustic? Paul Chapman. Paul Chapman. The thing was when we thought, well, should we change the lyrics slightly and call it our own? <laughs> <laughs> Do you think they'll notice? <laughs> That's cheap, I like that. <laughs> what happened to, uh, Michael, what, what is this thing that happened with this? Um, when we originally started with Michael, things were, were you know, kind of real hunky-dory, and then um, he found that he couldn't play without drinking, and this developed into a, a, a sort of big thing where he had to have this, and then he'd stop, and then he would take some tablets to make you stop, <laughs> yeah. and then uh, he, 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 went, he was a very complicated person. Yeah. I think he got more and more complicated as, as time went on. And he disappeared uh, on the eve of American tour. He, was didn't to, tour did he? he didn't want to go on the road and play. And then Paul came in with us. And uh, then in the end he said, I, I can't go on the road anymore. I can't, I cannot play on the road. And. Um, it was more or less, we was being more and more accommodating, you know, to such a point where you get to a point you cannot accommodate someone that much. And we said, OK, get another guitarist. Now, when you say he disappeared, and I don't know if this is a rumor, but someone told me that he literally disappeared for, like, quite some time. He did, yeah. He, after a show in London, he just, he just went off. The most exciting part of that story was, was where somebody discovered that he had a flat and they came round there and they found his guitars all smashed up in one corner. And then there was a load, there was a load of hair in the other one, cut all his hair off. It's terrible. I mean, the worst thing about that is, you know, the, the more you get asked about it, you know, the more you sort of dig up things from the file that you remember that aggravated you. And basically, you know, like someone used to be your friend, so to speak, and, uh, you know, you, you start to think, so, Christ, we did this and we did that, you know. And, uh, you know, obviously the, the Michael's a great guitarist, but when, when someone sort of uh, has no regard for going on to, you say, well, look, we've got these gigs, you know. People have bought tickets, they want to see you play. Well, I don't go. So, you know, I mean, like, that's when the fun starts to go. Yeah. It's, you know, you're sitting on an aeroplane going somewhere and, you know, you think, oh, God, is he going to play tonight? You know, does he want to Actually, play? favourite, one of his best expressions was, me before you. Really? And we should say, no, we've got to do this because this is right. Me before you. It's a showstopper, that one. One song which is a bit atypical for UFO, but I think is one of their finest works to date, is a song called Love to Love. That came where we used to work with Michael. He'd have loads of um, solos and things on a tape. And the actual solo from that was the original part of the song. That, and we just took the solo 
mm. and built the song around the solo. Yeah. Just ah. added a beginning, which is like the beginning of the hard, heavy beginning. When you play out on the song, sometimes you, um, if you fool around with them for a while, you get these different things come out, you know. And uh, I think when you, when you're doing something, it's nice to have that opportunity to, to muck around with them, you know, oh, yeah. to change them. And that particular number was one that that was fooled around with a lot, you know, he was just playing and having a drink. In the almost five years that Interview has been on the air, I'd be pretty hard pressed to name you more than two or three English musicians out of the dozens that have been before these microphones that have not claimed to be working class lads who have known a lot of hard work and their share of poverty. It is the same with Phil and Peter and is evidenced by the song letting go it's a perfect working class song yeah yeah it is i'm out up in the morning and beat the clock at nine it's when you've got to go to work you've got to get up and go to work there's no way in those i worked in a factory when we years ago when we never had any money for about three weeks and they do actually shut the gates of the factory I think the line that sums it up in the song, in your poetic uh, words, for how much more can a poor boy take when all he needs is an even break? A lot of kids don't get an even break, actually, do they? I'm Jim Ladd, the second half of our interview of UFO in just a moment. Back now with the second half of tonight's interview, and we're now going to take a look at UFO on stage. That album is almost, uh, you know, hardly overdubbed at all, which a lot of bands that uh, I've you know, I know of to overdub a hell of a lot, don't they, on uh, live albums. They don't do that. Oh, especially when you watch TV sometimes, and they go, here's a film of uh, such and such a band playing at such and such a place. And then you damn see, well it's not live. You, you know full well they've been in the studio for like two days re recording what it is, mm -hmm. and you literally see them lip syncing the, the track, you know, and they're playing away. They God. don't fool us. Well, we know the truth. <laughs> but you guys did not do that. But the hard thing is for a band, like for us, is actually to repeat the excitement of a live show onto a new album, you know, rather we, than... We did, a, well, we, did a, um, we did a tape for the BBC before we came away, which, which we said, oh, this is going to be awful because it's the BBC. Anyway, <laughs> we went and we, we, we mixed, down, mixed down the tape and it, was, it wasn't that wonderful. I mean, there are things wrong. We had to run up. We but, did make mistakes. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> but the initial, the, the essence of it was there, the excitement. It's funny, actually, being in a group that has actually no political, you know, we don't preach political views, we don't actually preach anything particularly. All we actually preach is, uh, you know, the big E chord or the a, big A chord, you know, and rock and roll. That's, that's what we believe in, but there are certain groups, and uh, fortunately, I would say, um, the ones who try and jump on this political bandwagon in England are getting a backlash by all these, like, minority parties coming down there and having fights at their shows, you know. It's, you a, know? Ba it's a good basic ingredient if you want to, if you want to change somebody's, get them while they're young, you know, influence them to that, that point, and that's the same thing as the National Front's doing it, you know, get young kids, while well, they're not really sure what they want to do, yeah. and uh, they, they draw them in. That's that group, Sham, Sham 69, can't play now, because every gig they do, they get, um, we've got National Front and the Nazi movement come down to them, and they can't actually play. A lot of bands so jumped trouble. on a sort of political thing, didn't they? Like, made out they had something to do with politics and that, and of course, as soon as a, a rock and roll band decides they have something to do with politics, then uh, all these fractions yeah, yeah. It will jump on it because they'll go down the shows and there'll be trouble and they're fighting there because the bands can't play. We don't go out of our way to tell people that we're a political band. We I mean, like, to be honest, the essence of our music is rock and roll. You know, if it comes up in a song, that. I mean, Phil likes the lyrics. I mean, I'm sure he's obviously telling me more about that, but we don't, you know, people talk about politics in their interviews. Um, to make a point of, you know, like giving themselves an image, uh -huh. which is, I think, is totally wrong. How, from being UFO, would you interpret Lights Out, Lights Out in London? I mean, what? It's meant to be, it's kind of a, an anti-national front song, because there's a very strong surge of uh, 
Nazi Party and the National Front, and it's meant to be lights out in London, you know. Is Only You Can Rock Me, is that a song to the audience? Yeah. It's us and the audience is, you know, like, only you can rock me. That's why it's good when you, um, when you have a really receptive audience that I don't have to sing the rock me, rock me part, and they do. You're sort of saying, well, we're the boys, we've got nothing to lose. They can relate to that for a minute. For a minute in the song, they've got nothing to lose, you know, they're not, yeah. We're back now at the conclusion of tonight's interview of UFO and a discussion of their working relationship with one of music's most respected and well-known producers, George Martin, who of course produced almost every single Beatle record that you and I have ever heard, and at his Montserrat recording studio in the Caribbean, produced UFO's latest album, No Place to Run. The thing, the thing about that was that we was looking for a producer, and we originally would have liked to have had tried out um, or gone with Ted Templeman, um, who his earlier work I'd enjoyed. I'm not reflecting on the, 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 latter, the groups he's doing at the moment, but a lot of his earlier work I really liked, you know, the sound he got. But he's a house producer for Warner Brothers or whatever, and we couldn't do it. But then uh, we got the brochures for Montserrat, which looked really nice. <laughs> and we said, we need a holiday. Let's go there and recall. And um, they said, are you using, how about using, Would you, George said he'd like to do the album. So we said, well, it's different enough for us to get something out of the thing other than, you know, what we would normally get. So we, we said, yeah, let's, let's go for it, let's try it. <coughs> and um, it was different enough that we got something out of it. You know, we, you learn each project you do, each thing you do, you learn something from. And we did get a lot out of it. We had the same engineer, too, who did those albums, who worked with George. We had the two of them. It was the same engineer. So Sergeant was... Pepper on the four track, I told us. That's right, man. Four tracks. <laughs> four track machine on Sergeant yeah. Pepper. But a lot of it goes to show, though, that uh, I think the quality of the material takes it away from anything else. You know, they I mean, knew what they were doing, weren't they? Actually, I mean, uh, say not being a Beatles fan, but... Yeah, four more bits from Liverpool. You they know, did know what they were doing. <laughs> People forget, actually. I mean, you listen to some of the Beatles albums, and I'm not a Beatles fan by any means, but, I mean, listen to Helter Skelter. I mean, you know? I mean, Helter is... Skelter is not the most quiet, lilting ballad that's Exactly, you know? I mean, it's that aspect. I mean, we're not the most quietest, lilting ballad group so as a final question how do you view your fans do you care how much they understand what you're saying or is it simply if they come to the concerts and buy the records at school usually thankfully people who do come to the concerts do understand it's usually journalists with this with our particular kind of band that don't understand um, where we're at or what we're about that is one of the things that's pulled us through maybe five years or six years of playing. Yeah, especially a touring band uh, like us, because it's not as if you're, you're li you know, living or earning money off of a, a big hit single <coughs> with a platinum album because you've had a hit single. You know, you're actually earning money off the people that are coming. Well, you know, if you're playing rock and roll and you see it before your eyes, people join it, and that's important. Good. This is very, this is great, this thing, because it doesn't go to the bottom, look. I know, it's just, <laughs> isn't that it frustrating? <laughs> oh, yeah. Of course, if I was really a hip DJ, you wouldn't have to, it'd be at the top, you know. Well, that's it, and that's the last, the last record we get played for KME, <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm going to, unfortunately, have to say goodbye. Is there right. anything you'd like to, uh, to wrap up or say goodbye to America? This will play all over the country, so... We're not going to say goodbye to America. I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs> you just said hello. What the hell? <laughs> You've got us. <laughs> yeah. The liquor stores are open a lot longer and other things are a lot better. This is Can't. a very fun country. Well, all right. I thank you both for coming here, really. I thank you. I appreciate it. And, and I enjoyed it very much. Great. All right. Well, I hope you enjoyed this last hour with UFO. And I also hope that you'll be here next week. Same time and same frequency for another interview. I'm Jim Lang.